Good morning. I'm glad to be with you again on this Sunday after our first full week of staying at home. Uh, I expect it's going to be the first full week uh, of many as we go through this. Uh, looking at the trends with other nations are going through, we are with them and uh, settling in for the long haul. And so um, I admit that personally, myself, even as uh, we're on the front end of this, I admit that I'm already feeling personally a bit overwhelmed. Um, I'm getting a lot of emails, people offering me resources. I'm getting a, a lot of uh, news stories demanding my attention and, and uh, the number of tasks I could, I'm thinking of that I could be doing uh, for the good of our community. I am, I admit, I'm, I'm struggling right now. I'm feeling rather overwhelmed, and so usually I would, at this time, on a, on a Sunday morning, I'd be able to check in with people face to face, and I can't do that right now because of uh, the situation we're in. And so I would appreciate it uh, just to hear from you. Drop me an email and, and let me know how are you doing. Are you overwhelmed and struggling? Are you bored? Well, what's up? Are you scared? Well, how, how, are, you, how are you doing? Some practical matters. We are uh, gathering volunteers to deliver groceries. Uh, we're going to take Wednesday, uh, Wednesday 9 to noon, uh, to deliver some groceries for uh, people who should not and cannot get out right now during this time and we need to stay at home. Uh, and so uh, other churches are taking other days of the week. We're taking Wednesday. And so if you can do this, please let me know. We're going to start this next Wednesday. And what it would mean is uh, be on call so that you can get called by the CNR uh, and you would go to the store, uh, pop your trunk, uh, the person from the grocery store would load your trunk, and then you would drive off to an address and then you would put the groceries on a person's front step. And then you'd leave. You would not uh, knock or interact with it. You don't actually interact with anybody and if you uh, can wear a pair of gloves uh, while you carry the groceries up that that is actually this is about as safe and as simple as we can make it and I will be doing this I, I think it is a, a solid setup so if you can take part in that please let me know and if you need to uh, be uh, need to get groceries please call CNR or uh, the food pantry continues to run here at the church. We will put food out for you or we'll, we'll drop it off for you. I think that's... Uh, oh, and then as you call each other, as you chat with each other online, as we're keeping in contact with, with each other, I believe that we are currently in contact with everyone in the church, either via... Uh, we're sending out... What I'm saying right now is being sent out weekly, printed out to everyone who doesn't have internet connection. Uh, I'm doing this uh, to connect people via YouTube. Uh, this is being emailed out, and, and I think we're getting, and then we're sending copies to the nursing homes. I believe we're getting to everyone, but as you talk to people, please ask and make sure. And if you find someone that is part of our church that is should be getting contacted and isn't, let me know. I, I don't want anyone to feel like they're dealing with this alone. And if you find someone who, who wants to start receiving this, whether they're a member of this church or not, just, just tell me. So uh, we do have, uh, we have a liturgist today, and so we're going to cut, cut to uh, Deb Sutton, who's going to do our readings for this morning. Our readings today is from Deuteronomy 12, 1 and 5 through 12. These are the statutes and ordinances that you must diligently observe in the land that the Lord the God of your ancestors has given you to occupy all the days that you live on the earth. You shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes as his habitation to put his name out there. You shall go there, bringing there your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your donations, your vo votive gifts, your free will offerings, and the firstlings of your herds and flocks. And you shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God you and your households together, rejoicing in all the undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not act as we are acting here today, all of us according to our own desires. For you have not yet come into the rest and the possession that the Lord your God is giving you. When you cross over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is allotting to you, and when he gives you rest from your enemies all around so that you live in safety, then you shall bring everything that I command you to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your donations. 
and all your choice votive gifts that you vowed to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you together with your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levites who reside in your towns. Deuteronomy 16, 1-8 Observe the month of Aviv by keeping the Passover for the Lord your God. And in the month of Aviv, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. You shall offer the Passover sacrifice for the Lord your God from the flock and the herd at the place that the Lord will choose as a dwelling for his name. You must not eat with it anything leavened. For seven days you shall not eat unleavened bread with it, the bread of affliction, because you came out of the land of Egypt in great haste so that all the days of your life you may remember the day of your departure from the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days, and none of the meat of what you slaughter on the evening of the first day shall remain until morning. You are not permitted to offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you. But at the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, only there shall you offer the Passover sacrifice. In the evening at sunset, the time of day when you departed from Egypt, you shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. The next morning you may go back to your tents. For six days you shall continue to eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly for the Lord your God when you shall do no work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the first great fantasy series I ever read was The Lord of the Rings. I remember being swept away by the story of the hobbits who left their beloved hobbiton to, to go on this great adventure, this great journey. And uh, over the course of three books, this story unfolds and they face this profound evil and, and through sacrifice and friendship they triumph. And I remember reading the chapter near the end of the third book in which it all sort of wraps up and the evil has been conquered and they're ready to go home. And I remember thinking to myself, there sure are a lot of chapters left in this book for this story being done. And I kept on reading and the story wasn't done because the hobbits, they had to go home. And when they got home, the place they returned to was different than when they had left. And they had changed too, even more profoundly. Like they'd been on this journey for years in, in the course of the story. And so when they return, they're not the same as when they left. And it was the first time I had read a book that laid out that that's how it works. That's life. That's what happens. And I think the, the fact that this story, this tells the, this, the books tell this story which is far better told in the books than the movie the movie kind of glosses over this uh, it echoes the life of the author J.R.R. Tolkien because he is someone who went off to war he went off to World War one and he returned to Britain but I'm certain that Britain that he returned to is not that wasn't the exact same Britain that he had left and far more importantly he was changed he was different the journey had changed him. Many of us have experienced this. Go off to college, go off, uh, many people are drafted to Vietnam, people, like when you come back from these times away, these transformative uh, journeys, when you come back you're not the same person. And uh, we, if we haven't experienced it ourselves, then we've watched it in others. And I think that's part of the dynamic that we're seeing today in these readings where we find the Hebrew people. Because the Hebrew people, they've gone on this great journey. They have left Egypt, and they've left Egypt as slaves who were not in control of themselves and worshipped the Egyptian gods because they were forced to. And over the course of this journey, they have become a people that have chosen to, they've taken this freedom they've been given, they, they've used it to choose to follow, follow God's Torah, God's guidance, God's teachings. They have chosen to be a people who uh, grapple with whatever comes over the horizon. They have become a people that can be their own judges. They have become a people who know how to handle the wilderness. This journey has changed them profoundly. And so after 40 years in the wilderness, they get to the end 
of their journey and they cross through the river Jordan and they enter into Judea. And this is when the Hebrew people become the Jews, the Jewish people of Judea, right? And so this, this profound sense of accomplishment had, had to have been amazing. And yet they weren't done because in the same way when the hobbits got home from their journey, they couldn't just like sit down and kick back and relax. The Jewish people, they get to their, they're not returning home, they're getting to their new home for the first time, but they have some things that are about to change as well. Like this whole journey has changed them and so now they have to, they have to keep on grappling with this. You see, uh, the Hebrew people had been uh, nomadic. They had traveled. That's what they had done. Day after day, for 40 years, they had been tra traveling people. And now they have a homeland. Now they have a home. And they're going to be farmers. Can you imagine how much of a change it would be to spend a lifetime being nomadic to then settle down and be a farmer? Like, this is a deep change that they're about to go through. And I think this is what we see in reading scripture. We read Exodus and it's the story, uh, the first half of Exodus is a story of the Hebrew people leaving Egypt. And then the second half is the story of them beginning to learn how to be God's people. And it begins with the Ten Commandments. Here are the Ten Commandments. Here's where we start. Here's how we're going to learn to be God's people. Numbers is the same thing. Numbers is more of this, how do we live as God's people during the time of being in the wilderness. And then we get to Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is what is the book of this moment when they're going from uh, being people on a journey to being people who end their journey and having been different because of their journey, now they're going to emerge on the other side. And what's that going to look like? Right? And so there are going to be some changes that have, have to happen. And so what happens is uh, we start reading Deuteronomy and we read things like it, Deuteronomy gives the Ten Commandments again. It doesn't give the Ten Commandments again because the people have forgotten. It gives the Ten Commandments again because on the other side of the journey, things are different. And they're still going to follow the Ten Commandments, but now they've got to figure out how to follow them, not as, as people who are nomadic. Now they have to figure out how to follow them as people who are uh, farmers. And we also get instruction, that was Deuteronomy 12 that we just read. And then uh, like in Deuteronomy 12, it tells us, like, these are the statutes and ordinances that you must diligently observe in the land, right? This is not the statutes and ordinances for on the journey. This is for what you need to do when you are in the land. And then it goes on to say, like, when you, now that you are in the land, how you are going to celebrate Passover has changed. Passover used to be all done with each individual family, each individually sacrificing a lamb in their own home. And now, now that you are in the land, things have to change. Things are going to be different. Now you're going to go to the place that God has chosen, the tabernacle, to sacrifice your lamb so that uh, we worship that way together. Now, that's talking about change on a level that's like... That's a big change. That's a big deal. Think about what it means to change how you celebrate a holiday or a holy day. Like the, the, the Passover is a holy day. And, and uh, like, think what, what it means to change how you celebrate a holiday. Like, they're still going to celebrate the Passover. Because the Passover is when they tell the story and they, they root themselves in the story of being the people that God loves so much that he calls them out of, out of slavery, out of Egypt, to send them towards the Promised Land. But... Now they're, they got the promised land, how they're going to celebrate is going to change. And I know how hard it is to change a holiday because I know how hard I resisted when my mama said, let's not make the cream de mince brownies for Christmas anymore. And my response was, we can't do that. Like, I talked to my brother, he had the exact same response. We must have the cream de mince brownies if we're going to celebrate Christmas. We have to have them. That's what it means to celebrate Christmas, cream to mint brownies, at least if your last name is Coon. And um, thankfully my wife did pick up the mantle of making the cream to mint brownies. And uh, so brownies were made, Christmas is, is, is still uh, celebrated, but that change was, was like, we had, to, we had to talk about this. 
And, and think about the, the Hebrew people as they're becoming the Jews of Judea and the Promised Land. Think about all the changes they're having to go through uh, in this transitional time and, and all the things that are up in the air and all the grieving and all of the uh, loss and all of the, all the struggles that they would have gone through. I find this, the, the ending of the story of, of the time of the wilderness and the transition to uh, learning a new way of life in the promised land to be uh, helpful for me right now um, because that's kind of where we're at. We're in a transition period. We're in a transition, we, we've, we're used to a certain way of life and now we've started a new way of life for an unknown period of time. We don't know how long this will be. And looking at how uh, the, the Hebrew people, how, how they become the Jewish people, and how they hold on to what's essential. We're still going to have the Ten Commandments. We're still going to celebrate Passover. But how we do it is going to change because it has to, because our situation changed. Well, that rings very true right now. That rings very true to me. And, and I'm not particularly excited about those changes, but that's where we're at. We're, we're, we're considering these things. And so what I can continue to say is whether we're in the, whatever situation we're in, we continue to be the church. We continue be, to be the church that gathers or gathers in this fashion and will gather in person again in the future, hopefully sooner than we fear. But we are the people who proclaim Jesus Christ is risen today. We proclaim him to be Lord. We proclaim that uh, as we follow him, we are going to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit such that we are more Christ-like, more gracious, more humble, more forthright, that we are going to be the people who serve. And uh, we're going to become the people God has planned for us to be. And this is what the church has done before. This is what the church has always done. This is what the church will do now. Let me tell you how the church has done it before, because I think it's helpful for how we think about how we are church now, in this sort of transitional state. And just in the same way as the hobbits come home from their journey and they have to figure out this new situation, in the same way the Hebrews end their journey and they have to figure out this new situation, as we're, we're trying to figure out this new situation, I think we can look to our past and see how we have handled this before. And I know I've shared this with you uh, at least once before, but I'll tell you again that in the Middle Ages, the people who created the first hospitals were Christians. And it's in the Middle Ages, so science and medicine were, well, science does not exist, didn't exist, and medicine was ineffectual. And so hospitals were created so that people who were sick could come to the hospital, and then they were patients from the word patient, as in we're going to wait. We're going to wait this out. And we're going to wait this out. We don't know. Are, are you going to get better? Are you going to get worse? We don't know. But we are not going to ask anyone to wait alone. That's not how we do things. We follow Jesus. That's where hospitals come from. Today, this is still true. We are being patient. And in an odd twist, it's not just the sick people who are having to be patient and, and uh, we're all having to wait because of the particular nature of this virus, but that doesn't change that no one need to be patient alone. And so, though we cannot gather together in person, we can keep track of each other. We can stay connected. We can do what it takes so that no one has to wait alone. And so please, call people. Write people. You know, with pen and paper even. Email people, Skype people, Zoom people, whatever, whatever you can do. We have so many tools to keep track of people. In these days, and we're in these, this time, and we're shifting from, from one way of life to another, uh, let's make sure that we do it in a way that is Christ-like, i.e., let's make sure we do it in a way so that no one has to wait alone. And on the other side of this, we will gather again. We will gather again, and when we gather again, it will be joyous and good, and we will be able to reconnect in ways uh, that we, we look forward to. I'm looking forward to eating with each of you again as soon as we can.
until that day, please be patient with each other. Stay connected. Doing so out of a deep love of God and over, letting that overflow to be a deep love of our neighbors. Amen. Now we have been asked to pray for some people, some of our, our neighbors. If you have any prayer concerns, please uh, tell them uh, to me, whatever way you'd like to get that message to me. Uh, and we want to pray for uh, Jason Wilhoit, who is a son of Shelbina, a son of Virgil uh, Wilhoit, who is in his 40s and is on a ventilator at a hospital in Columbia uh, from COVID-19, which is kind of scary. Also be praying, for, uh, be praying for Wayne Nieder as he faces a variety of health challenges, as well as for the people uh, in quarantine with, around the fellow who was uh, sick up at Salt, Roy, Salt, Salt Lake. Um, let's pray. Lord, it is sinking in that we might be at this for a while. Then we, we pray that our hands might be occupied, if not with our usual work, then in prayer. That our minds might not be frantic, but they might be at peace. That our hope might be sustained by looking at how you guided the Hebrew people through their journey. We pray for our leaders that they might act wisely, listening to doctors and scientists who serve us. We pray for all of those who are waiting for test results in a time of limbo. We pray for those who are in quarantine. We pray for those who are giving tests. We pray, for those, we pray for those who are caring for the sick, who are risking their own health for the good of others. For these saints, we are thankful. We pray for those who are dealing with health challenges during this day, the ones that just come up in the course of life, including Wayne Niederer. Uh, we also pray for Jason Wilhoy and for uh, the person up at Salt River has come down with this as well. We pray in these days that you would give us patience to take each day one day at a time. Amen. Please stay safe and uh, please know that I'm beginning to make plans for Easter. I'll be asking for some help. I think we're going to be able to do a drive-in. We have about 50 parking spots. And if everyone uses the bathroom, we won't have bathroom facilities available. Use the bathroom, come park, Crack your windows open. I'll, I think uh, I've got a set up with speakers so that we'll be able to have worship together on Easter. I'll have more details out to you next week, and uh, let me know. Keep me updated on how people are doing. Have a good day. Bye.